Coming up on Techzilla, is it time to change your passwords? Google's got image search. What to do when your router breaks the internet? Make Netflix look better. Robert battles with the PS3, reviews an LG HD TV, and oh so much more. Do yourself a favor, grab the popcorn and sprinkle on the brewer's yeast, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is brought to you by Audible, West Host, and Thrillist. Just once, I want that little voice to go, ponies! <laughs> I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to Techzilla. Hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Hey, whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or where the best Mexican food is here in the Bay Area, well... We've got several answers for you. Many hours you will spend eating. <laughs> and if we don't, we'll track down someone who does. We are shooting this episode a week early so folks can get their vacation on next week. So we're pretty much going to not has news. Well, our apologies. There are other places they could go. I, one of my personal favorites, Tech Meme, GigaOhm, PCMag.com, PCPro.com, Boy Genius Report, Gizmodo, and Gadget. You just won't have us tamingly fire hose that is tech news as story after story piles up and tries to eat your face. I use Reddit. I have it aggregate my news into one interesting list of stuff <laughs> with all those categories. Is that list safe for work? Probably not, but I mean, you I, could work, probably, I work for myself, so yeah, yeah it's safe for work. <laughs> no, you know, you can uncheck all the, the so-called naughty bits. All the good stuff. All the good stuff. You could do, so you could do a Reddit safe for work list. Reddit's amazing. Let your way. parents edit it for you. Let's get hey. you set up. Just as we were going to tape today, Roger found and became mildly obsessed by Google search by image. It's pretty simple. Now you can explore the web in an entirely new way by beginning your Google search with an image. So try it now, images.google.com, and oh, let's drag this thing up there. And look, it gave us the Tokyo Ward flags. Interesting. Amazing. If you actually want to see something, you know, then it's got this bridge. And it's the Clifton Suspension Bridge drawing. But there are things that may be too subtle as of yet for Google Images. For example, me. So we got a lot of me. And then we get a lot of visually similar images, which oh, is actually... Oh, you can find your doppelganger, man. This is okay. It's my a dark background with a clone is available. brown search. And <laughs> I just love the fact that, like, this... It's See, a similar image to me wearing a scally cap. You know, I'm just, I'm just, call me crazy, but I'm just not seeing mm. that being, mm. yeah. I wonder hey. how this compares to the results you'd see in TinEye. Because that's Ooh. a service so many people use for basically finding, where did this image come from? And that's yet another Tin one of those tools. amazing. If it's you've never seen TinEye, T-I-N-E-Y-E. -E. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to upload the image right now because we'll spend like two minutes waiting for that because the internet the hates tubes. me. The tubes. The tubes. I'm not, I'm not going to demonstrate. TinEye.com, check it out yourself. Uh, Jacob had a good question for us. Would you recommend OS X Lion to any Mac user? Hmm. Could you ask us after we've installed it? We do not currently have access to developer versions. Um, Why? Because we haven't signed up for them. Oh, okay. And Apple PR there's a, there's doesn't a good talk reason. to us. No. But, um, but the people I know who are running it seem very excited about it, but they were also excited about every other version of OS X that has ever come out. New and OSs are cool. I actually enjoy running a new OS. I love it. That's like, uh, that's oh, except I, for Windows I'm ME. Kind of nerd out on that stuff, but you Windows know. ME sucks. I, 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 think, I think I totally skipped that one. Yeah, I had to run it because of some hardware. XP in the Windows blood. Windows Vista really sucked. Actually, I, I'm curious. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, getting hands on with uh, OS X Lion. Um, Roberto, by the way, had an interesting experience uh, claiming his free games from the PlayStation Network. What happened, dude? Yeah, well, there's this whole deal going on right now if you have a PlayStation and you've had the problems that they went through with their network mm -hmm. and everything. Well, I was one of those people who was trying to get their free games, and last night I was doing this, and this is part of their Welcome Back program. I downloaded two of my games, but one of them didn't appear in my games list, and it turns out the fix is pretty easy, but it wasn't very intuitive, and I basically will guide you through it right now. Now, from the cross media bar interface, uh, look for the PlayStation Network uh, logo there and select account management under that action. Then you select transaction management. And then the services list. This is, I'm telling you, it wasn't very intuitive. 
From there, you should see two options. Uh, you want to select the SECA, the Sony Computer Entertainment America promotion link, which then should let you select which of the two freebies is giving you grief. In my case, I think it was number two or number one. I don't remember which one it was. Either way, you're going to get a screen like this, except where it says remaining zero. It'll say remaining one, and then a link to go ahead and download it again. And then once you do that, you're good to go. That game should then appear in the list. It was uh, pretty frustrating to just be selecting the things I wanted, and then suddenly, one of them wasn't there. Also, you get a three, uh, you get a three, you get a free 30-day free trial of PlayStation Plus. Basically, it's an automatic update feature for the whole game console. Uh, you get that for free, but I, I really feel it's a shame that feature isn't free beyond the 30-day trial. I understand some of the other features related to PlayStation mm -hmm. Plus would want to be a paid-for thing, kind of like Xbox Gold or memberships to Xbox Live. However, that one feature for just doing automatic updates on the console would be, I think, a pretty nice thing to give away. A nice gift. A generous, please continue to give us money every month. I have to figure out what they're charging per month for that. I haven't looked, but uh, I'm enjoying the free updates. Automatic updates. Are you basically happy that the PlayStation Network is back? It is, because some of the games I had have downloadable content. Like, I picked up L.A. Noir and mm -hmm. a few others, and there's some free content for that. Now, I was right. unable to access any of it. Also, some of the games I had purchased... I needed the full version, and I was stuck with demo versions for a while. It was a really odd situation I was in, but yeah, I'm glad it's back. It's, it's, it's nice. It's something I paid for. I'm glad it's working again, because that's <laughs> the, the down, the bottom line on that So the, the hacking and the cracking and the mayhem and the nightmare. That's, that's going to go on forever. You're just like, whatever, I can yeah. play my games again. Honestly, yeah. I've if I, if I have to, I'll pull the plug, on, as far as the internet goes, and just sit back. I'm I did so hook it up to a 3D that. TV, so I had that whole experience of uh, I mean, doing the full setup on a PlayStation 3. It, it's, it actually detected the TV as a 3D TV. It's like, oh, do you actually have a 3D TV? Yes. What size is the screen? It actually wanted to know in inches the, the screen size. And I was like, oh, why? <laughs> and I'd like to know the technical reason behind that. And if anybody out at Sony happens to be watching me right now, please answer that for me. They might be taking a survey. They may be. <laughs> may be. Router problems suck, or as Brody in Bend, Oregon has... Well, he's got an irritating one. He says, Hello, Texilla crew. For the last week, I've been experiencing a problem with my D-Link DIR825 gigabit router. Some websites work, e.g. YouTube and Gmail, and some don't, Orvis.com and Revision3.com, so you're fly fishing when you're not watching us. I've factory reset the router, and the problem still persists. I know, the router be uh, I know it's the router because when I plug my laptop directly into my cable modem, everything works. In the meantime, I've been using an old, retired Linksys router, and I would like to get back on my D-Link as soon as possible. Brody in Bend, Oregon. Oh. I'm curious if it worked on the old router perfectly. Interesting. Yes. Uh, my initial thought was a DNS issue, a lookup issue. I've had a similar problem in the past with my, my internet provider, actually. One of their DNS numbers actually started, my primary one started failing, and I ended up not being able to hit a majority of the sites I was looking for. And then I started experimenting with things like open DNS and I think Google actually provides a DNS benchmark tool that allows right. you to see which DNS around you can be used for the best performance. And I made those tweaks within the router itself. So that way you don't have to change the DNS lookups on yeah. every computer that's connected to your router. And it's cool because basically the, the DNS is the phone book for the internet. By totally. using Google's tool, you can examine like which one works best. It's what in converts your the, the area. URL into the number and right. vice versa. Because nobody can remember that www.herons. 192.168. Yeah. Zero dot. Dotted oh, quads <laughs> and 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 IP6 is going to IPv6 is going to make it even worse. You know, so normally we'd say, hey, try try using OpenDNS in your router and see if that fix it because maybe it's a problem with your 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 uh, ISP. The reality is is that that particular router, it's one of those it's one of those products where you look at it on Amazon, and there's like 50% of the people give it five stars and 50% of the people give it one star. So totally. this is an estimate. I I don't I have not counted each individual one. Love it or hate it. There's definitely sort of an inverse bell curve where, yeah, love and hate are, are big and the middle is just not existing. Um, I'm going to say anytime you run into a massive, weird, it resets itself for no particular reason, uh, start Googling the name of the product on the Internet because there there's some interesting ideas about whether or not you can, you know, run into problems with the way it administers uh, or like caches information inside of the router, but you wiped it and started all over again, so that should not be a problem. I would say update your firmware. Oh, totally. Because there have been uh, the, the early editions of the firmware for, the, for, the, for that router from D-Link were buggy at best. I think calling them buggy would be generous. They I had the 655 messy. version of that right. router. Well, you've got a different router period, but yeah, I checked this firmware. Well, it's this been updated like the, This is like the step times. up from the 655. Totally. I, I, I've otherwise had terrific performance right. with that router. Compared to the old router I had, I had a dramatic boost in performance with my same 
cable, my same cable modem with a new router. That was the one thing I did. And then I ended up changing the, the modem later on, too, right. when I realized it was a problem. But that's a whole other issue. I would definitely <laughs> update the firmware if you haven't recently and see if that solves it. And I, I agree. hope it does. Hey, let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, West Host. West Host, they've been offering premium web hosting since 1998. Super affordable. We're talking about plans starting at 19 cents a day, free US-based support, so you can actually reach them and understand them 24 hours a day, seven days a week by phone, chat, and email. And you'll get free website transfers and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Want to check out West Host? Go to westhost.com slash techzilla. You'll get an exclusive 25% discount off web hosting, and you'll be helping us keep Techzilla on the air. Time to get our HD Nation on. And speaking of infinite <laughs> HDMI ports from our last episode. Just won't leave. <laughs> you say infinite hey, HDMI once. I know. Hey, Matt, Matt writes in, hey guys, just catching up with this week's shows and noticed that you guys didn't have a huge list of AV receivers that had an abundance of HDMI inputs. Check out Yamaha's website. I personally run a Yamaha receiver with 7.2 sound and have thoroughly enjoyed the performance along with a large amount of inputs. Here's the link for one of their receivers that hosts seven HDMI inputs along with two HDMI outputs as well. Enjoy the show and keep it up. Sign Matt in Riverside, California. That is a now, lot of HDMI inputs. Now in the more finite world, uh, Ron's got a pretty common Netflix problem. His ISP seems to be, uh, quote, sucking wind. Because <laughs> my, my question is about connecting my household's LAN. Uh, the Blu-ray player's built-in 802.11 and Wi-Fi works but shows a low half a megabit per second connection speed to Netflix. I have an ethernet cable going to the living room for my DISH network receiver. Should I add a hub or a switch and get the Blu-ray play player on a wired link? Do you, have a, do you have a suggestion for a good but cheap solution? Or do you think the bandwidth is so low because of my ISP cable vision? Uh, speedtest.net says that I have a download speed of about one megabit per second. Ow. The same time of day, evening that I was trying to watch Netflix, Cablevision advertises the download speed of 15 megabits. Per second, but I guess that's only when no one else is online. Maybe switching to Verizon FiOS or FiOS, oh, I always get that backwards, <laughs> would be the best solution. Any thoughts are welcome. Signed, Ron. Now, uh, I, I prefer to have my hardware all, and especially my video devices, Ethernet on, hardwire. Going to Ethernet. Yeah. I've, I've, I've tried doing wireless with HD streaming. I actually have like a, I a have fewer five issues. port switch on my media tower. I did I'm going to have to either add a second five-port switch or go to a ten-port tower because of all the weird little. I recently added a five-port switch with. to my uh, instead of just doing wireless to the very front of the living room, mm -hmm. and it's great. I take one of the ports off my router, gigabit, right. to a gigabit switch, and it's all automatically linked and doing its thing. And I really like it. And I picked it up. I want to say it was less about thirty dollars. Yeah, and it's, they're not very expensive. If you if you need more ports, yeah, you pay a little bit more. I, I actually just saw some nice, decent brand five port gigabit switches on sellout.woot.com for like six bucks. Switches are, are are sorted technology. They're done. Just buy one. If you want to get fancy, buy one from the same company that made your router. Uh, I was wondering maybe because maybe there's been a switch advance or something. I asked the uh, most excellent people at uh, smallnetbuilder.com a switch brand made a difference. They're on Twitter now, by the way, at smallnetbuilder. Ooh. Uh, and they said, nope, Gigabit is very mature tech, and all the switches between, or all the switches support wire speed between all ports simultaneously. So just buy a switch, buy a cheap switch, totally throw it in there. My um, new one says it will turn off ports that are unused and, cool. and minimize the electricity needed for each You've port. You got a D Link, don't you? Yeah, I did. Like one of their green routers. Yeah, <laughs> I had a D Link router, D Link switch. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, given how slow your speed test is. Uh, I got to say, did you run it over a hardwire connection to your router with nobody else in the house using the internet, right? Yeah. You did that over because you don't want to do it over wireless. You want to make sure like Timmy isn't downloading something in the other room. You should probably call your ISP, call Cablevision, and say, "Hey, can you check my connection?" Because sometimes uh, either the physical provisioning, uh, or I should say, the, the computer provisioning or the physical wiring uh, can have issues that drop your speed. Because it's funny, Netflix does now a monthly since January. They started doing their their uh, the Netflix tech blog Netflix. Oh, does nice. a monthly Netflix performance on top ISP networks. So you get this huge chart, which looks like this. And it's uh, kilobits per second, and it's from the best to the worst. And it's Charter, Comcast, Cable One, TWC, Cox, Sunlink, Cablevision, Verizon. And then you get down here to AT&T, CenturyLink, Windstream, Frontier, and Clearwire. Clearwire dun, sucking dun, 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 the big dun. wind down there at the bottom. So Netflix actually should be, or excuse me, Cablevision, Netflix should look pretty good on Cablevision. You should be at least be getting like, you know, two, two megabits down. 
Um, if you can try rebooting all the hardware too, the, yeah. the cable modem and the router together. And sometimes if you have the voice and data all coming in in one box, you can't really reboot those boxes. They have battery backups in them, they're not made to really be turned on and off. However, if you have the standalone cable modem, right. that's a good thing to try to redo. Unplug the cable modem, unplug the router, plug totally. in the cable modem, plug in the router. Or if you have an old cable modem and it's been a while, maybe you've been using the same surface for five years, see if they have a new version of, right. the, of the modem and that can make a world of difference too. Is my cable modem DOCSIS 3.0? Can you yeah. verify that? Can a technician check my lines? Um, also, by the way, go into your Netflix account setting and look for the manage video quality settings. Um, I did not know this. This is actually something that's worth looking for. Uh, basically, we know some of you have internet data caps. We want to make it easier uh, for you to manage how much data you use. We offer three video quality settings to help manage your data usage. At the firehose um, mode. Well, basically, make sure you're not down on good quality, right? Good quality is around uh, 0.3 gigabytes per hour. That's about 0.7 megabits per second. Best quality is uh, a gigabyte per hour uh, or around, it's, it's kind of funny, gigabyte per hour, up to 2.3 gigabytes per hour for HD. Um, which you know is, is 2.27 to like three something megabits nice. down. I have to start tracking my bandwidth uh, consumption because I can see back here my I'm wife is watching Joan Rivers. Uh, the, my my wife like she doesn't watch any television, and then there'll be a binge, usually involving <laughs> like uh, Bones. She loves that series. Right. It's on Netflix. Netflix.com slash Texilla. Um, that said, if you have problems getting them to help you sort this out, Cablevision when you call them, and Fios, Fios, Verizon's... I think I would know that by oh now. Oh, my goodness. Uh, if, if you can get Fios, get it. Because... And, and Buy for fiber. Do you know yeah. anybody who doesn't like Fios or any form of fiber that they have? Not really. Yeah. They all seem pretty content. So cue the giant pile of angry email from Texilla viewers with Fios at home who hate it. <laughs> But everybody I know who has it is absolutely thrilled with it because it's stupid fast and it's stupid well provisioned. I'm going to go grab your LG television. Oh, sweet. So it's all plugged in and everything. There's not a terrible crash around the corner. No. Let's, let's see if the, uh, the cable actually holds up. What Pat's dragging over is actually the LG 50 PZ 550. It's a brand new 3D plasma. And there goes all the cores. Actually, let me restart some video. Back, 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 back. Obviously, I'm not up for that job on the Price is Right. This is one of their more affordable models, actually. This isn't the top of the line. And I have to say, overall, I was pretty impressed. Let me get it centered here. Does this look OK? Looks look at fantastic. That. Here, let me get to the, is there a chapter mark We're not going to see anything that's going to make us cry, are we? I hope not. It's supposedly just a uh, Oh, and it's in 3D mode. Oh! Oh, the blur. You hurt me. Let me turn off the 3D. <laughs> Cancel. I want hey, to the see one, animals, not bleeding pro eyeballs. Tip, if you're watching 3D programming, you can hit the cancel button, and that didn't do a darn thing, apparently. <laughs> Let me try that one more time. Where's the exit 3D mode? Turn off 3D mode. Enter. Ah, there we go. Ah, ah. there we go. <laughs> this baby, the uh, PZ550, has an online price of about $1,100, and it uses active shutter glass technology. They're fancy glass we have charging up right there. It also includes LG's Netcast Entertainment Access. Uh, that's basically their internet-based streaming services. So your Netflix, your Pandora, and other things like that. Uh, Wi-Fi dongle is optional, but it's got Ethernet on the back, so it's, it's ready to go. Uh, a thin bezel design, about an inch wide. That's, that's what caught my eye, I'd have to say, first. Basically, the, the border around it is about an inch. We even still have the plastic on it, which is how, how much we're rolling. Just uh, nice glossy black. Uh, actually includes uh, four HDMI ports, one on the side. And I see this TV really competing almost directly with the Panasonic ST30 that we looked at about oh, pretty recently, like one or two weeks ago. Uh, right now, this LG has a slight price advantage. And I'm curious, though, how the picture performance compared. And bringing up the first thing, Cinema 1, basically, actually, it was pretty darn well. Do you have that uh, one chart for me, sir? Uh, Sorry, right out of I the box. It was on the thumb drive, and it turned out to be in my email. Ah, oh, it is in your email. Actually, I have to say, right out of the box, LG did a really good setup job in terms of its color. The primary and secondary color points, uh, basically your red, blue, green, yellow, cy uh, cyan, and magenta, they were pretty close to the targets that you want them to be at for HD video. And the default white balance, basically what the color of white is, in its cinema mode, it was too blue, but it was decent, especially compared to the ST30's default setup. You can see right there, the blue's a little jacked up. But the uh, CIE... Not, not the blue for me highlighting. <laughs> the CIE chart down in the uh, bottom center there, the uh, nice color triangle. 
<laughs> Sorry. There we go. Where those color points are on that chart is actually pretty darn good for something that's coming right out of the box. Now, they have a pretty decent set of controls as well for looking at, yeah, you see that? In the white point in the middle, that gives you an idea. You remember, you see how all the blue bars up above you there are kind of spiked up a little? Well, it in turn moves the white point toward blue a little bit, meaning that instead of being a more neutral gray or neutral shades of gray, mm -hmm. they're a little bluish, which isn't bad necessarily, but that does need to be corrected if you want accurate, accurate uh, spec per se. Now, uh, cleaning up the white balance, you can see right there, with the tools available, I was able to dial that in and actually hammer down those blues a little bit. However, like you can see right there, especially at the, in this case at the 60% mark, essentially, it was a little out of whack. And it was hard to get that to be correct. If I, if I moved the 60 mark and got it right, something else would spike up. Hmm. And I kept dancing around trying to get that just the way I wanted. And this is kind of really what you end up with when you talk about one of the more value-oriented 3D right. TVs. There's what do they, what differentiates a TV like this say to compare it to the the premium model that LG offers? Well, like THX certification and more massaging of the picture itself before it leaves the factory. But the bottom line really is that the PZ550 is one of the best deals out there for 50-inch 3D screen. Uh, picture performance-wise, uh, I was impressed with it. And uh, Panasonic similar spec ST30. When I compared it to that, that's really where I was like, wow, uh, LG's doing a slightly better job in the mid-range than Panasonic in terms of their default setups. And the LG's a couple hundred bucks less. What do you expect this to street for? J just barely over a thousand. It wow. was like a thousand twelve or something, average street price. And the glasses run about 75 bucks, a little bit less than that. The prices keep dropping. Another difference I've also found between plasmas like these, uh, the mid-range plasmas compared to the ultra high end, is a filter that goes on the front. Mm -hmm. They actually make the, the, the filters on the more expensive TVs really dark so that if this TV were letterboxed or something, you'd notice that the black of a letterbox bar mm -hmm. would be a little bit more gray than it would be on a more expensive TV where they're using a darker front filter and just making it brighter from behind. And that's where I began to appreciate. But in a dark room, you wouldn't notice really, well, you'd probably notice some differences, but <laughs> there'd be less differences in a dark room compared to a bright room with right. these TVs and the more expensive cousins of theirs. So. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, another option for the mid-range. It's a thousand dollars for a fifty-inch. Not TV bad. It looks for ten eighty p. Netflix. I actually have this hooked up to their new uh, five sixty Blu-ray player. Five sixty. Oh, six seventy. Excuse me. Wi-Fi Blu-ray player. But well, we'll show that off in upcoming episodes. We're gonna have like a giant comparison. The Blu-ray showdown's coming up. But first, now it's time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of June twenty-eighth, twenty eleven. First up. Lord of the Rings, the Motion Picture Trilogy, Extended Editions. Last April, they released the trilogy on Blu-ray, but that was only the theatrical editions, which angered fans far and wide. Now those fans can rejoice, as the extended editions of this trilogy are now being released on Blu-ray. This release gets an MPEG-4 AVC codec, a 2.41 to 1 aspect ratio, and a DTS-HD Master Audio 6.1 soundtrack. Each film comes with four different commentary tracks, and each film has its own feature length making of documentary. Plus, there are tons of featurettes going into various aspects of the production. Too many to list here. Each film is divided across two Blu-ray discs, totaling six 50-gigabyte discs, and the special features, digital copies, and the aforementioned feature-length documentaries are spread across nine DVDs. Next up, Sucker Punch. This 2011 film by the director of Watchmen, Zack Snyder, got mixed reviews when it came out, to be generous about it. You can get the release in either the standard release or the extended edition, which adds 18 minutes of footage, bumps the rating from PG-13 to an R, and I'm told improves the film quite a bit. Both versions come in a 239 to 1 aspect ratio and include a DTS-HD Master Audio 5.1 soundtrack. Extras include a three-minute featurette about the soundtrack, four animated shorts, and the extended cut includes Maximum Movie Mode, an interactive video commentary that includes animated storyboards, interviews with Snyder, and more. Also released this week, Season of the Witch. This 2011 film takes place in the 14th century, starring Nicolas Cage as a knight that has to escort a suspected witch to a monastery. With an MPEG-4 ABC codec, 185 to 1 aspect ratio, and a DTS HD Master Audio 5.1 mix, this release also comes with a digital copy. Extras include a shocking alternate ending, deleted scenes, behind the scenes featurettes, audio commentaries, and more. And as always, check out our show notes at techzilla.com or hdnation.tv for the rest of this week's Blu-ray releases. Now it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Audible. 
Audible.com. It is an amazing place to find digital audiobooks. They're the leading provider of downloadable digital audiobooks and spoken word entertainment. They've got over 75,000 titles to choose from. You can download them to your iPod, your MP3 player, play them back anywhere, anytime. They are so good for long plane rides and road trips. Choose from books in every genre, science fiction, thrillers, drama, comedy, business, history, and quite a few more. Do yourself a favor, go to audiblepodcast.com slash techzilla to get a free audiobook download of your choice when you sign up today. Again, go to audiblepodcast.com slash techzilla. You get a free audiobook and you'll keep Techzilla coming to you on the air. We hate more than, well, we just hate going more than a week or two without reminding you to back up your files, do it. your stuff, your data. Do it. Preferably offsite. Carbonite, good example. You can get a discount on that with Texilla. But this week, we're going to get slightly paranoid in a slightly different way, thanks to Ryan in Naperville, Illinois. He says, hey, Texilla, I don't think the recent doings of the Lulzsec group releasing 62,000 plus logins to various websites. I think it's time to remind everyone again how important it is to change your passwords frequently, how to choose good passwords, and how to use password services like KeePass to keep them all safe and memorized. Ryan in Naperville, Illinois. Key pass is good. I love it. Um, he loves it. But yes. the last time we mentioned it back in January or February, we got a few zillion emails about last pass, uh, or I should say last pass. Uh, Andy summarized it up pretty good. Quote, LastPass offers the same service through much more secure methods. It is also cross-platform on Mac, Windows, and Linux, and is offered as a free service, but they have a premium service for a whopping $1 a month that allows you to also use it on Android, iOS, or BlackBerry, as well as the portable versions for carrying around on a thumb drive you can use on public computers. Uh, frankly, we don't care what you use, although KeePass or LastPass is a lot easier than a giant dock of spreadsheets filled with passwords, which I have done. <laughs> they also make it easier to regularly rotate passwords which along with avoiding obvious passwords like your name, your birthday, one, two, three, four, five, the password is password, you get the idea. <laughs> it should include a mix of numbers, letters, capitals, special keys, if allowed, or at least as many of those as the service will allow. Yeah, just, I try to mix it up hard. Which, uh, which well, you one? use you use KeePass. I do, and um, it has some terrific generation tools for just, you can select uh, what will this field accept as far as right. characters go, you enter it, but most importantly, I can have it on my portable device. Uh, with the iPhone, you have to use a third-party device, but there's a free app that's written by the guys themselves for Android platform that I've recommended to my friends who use Android. And it's cross-platform for the other tools as well. Right. But I prefer the tools that include, if you're going to use it on a mobile device, I'd mm -hmm. rather have the person who wrote the program to actually support the mobile app as well. <laughs> and that's yeah. why a lot of people I know love 1Password. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm probably going to set my mom up with, to be honest with you. One password for mama. One password to rule them all. So um, um, but any of these apps, what it encourages me to do right. is to use just, you can use up to 25 characters in your right. password. Well, it's going to be 25 characters then, or 24 just to be safe. <laughs> I always wonder about sometimes, was it going to break? But, but the other, the downside is if I don't have mobile access to that, there, or I don't have a way to get at that remotely, I can't guess that password. I, I'm not right. going to remember that password. Well, nobody's going to remember like star pound oh, seven ridiculous. lowercase a capital Z lowercase y u eight seven ampersand tilde tilde. I mean, but LastPass or KeePass can. And, and one of the things that uh, one of the things that, that we should stress is you should be you know as I click here between random pages for LastPass and KeePass, you should take the time to change your passwords regularly. Because sometimes people steal logins and passwords and they sit on them for months. And then suddenly they have a reason to play with them. And if you change your password every couple, three months, and it's a luck thing, it's a timing thing, but if you change your passwords regularly, then by the time they get to play around with your account, you will have already changed your passwords and they can't get in. That would be really nice. Um, but I'm almost certain these apps can provide you with reminders to cycle your password anyway. So you, you may be even to automate it on some of them as well. So it will just do it for you and then you don't even have to think about it. Although, no, you probably can't do that because you'll have to, Never mind. Just forget what I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's. But it's, you can rotate the passwords easily. They're easy to use. They manage your passwords. They're secure. They're safe. They're a really smart idea. Because there's there's nothing worse than finding out that company A lost your your login and your password, and you use that for every other thing on the internet. That's where it gets dangerous. That would be bad. All right. So. Use good passwords, change them regularly, use LastPass or KeePass or 1Password, keep your stuff secure. Right now, though, we got to thank one of our sponsors, Thrillist. 
You know how you have that one friend who always hooks you up with the cool new bands before anybody else has even heard of them? Thrillist, they're kind of like that, but for cool new stuff to do in your city. Thrillist is a free daily email that sifts through the crap to find the best new bars, restaurants, events, and services. Whatever it is, they promise it won't suck. You want to know about a restaurant with cheeseburger spring rolls or an underground tequila library or a Star Wars burlesque show? I hear the panting. Plus, Thrillist even got a national version that'll hook you up with scoops on hot new gadgets, gear, and funny sites from all over the web. And do we mention that all of this is free? Do yourself a favor, go to Thrillist.com slash Techzilla. You'll start getting Thrillist's sweet, sweet knowledge right away, and you'll be helping support Techzilla and keep us coming to you twice a week, every week. Aaron writes in, Last episode, you stated how Ubuntu comes pre-installed with OpenOffice. Sadly, this was changed in the Natty Narwhal 11.04 edition. It now uses LibreOffice. Signed, Aaron. Thanks for the update. I did not know that. I, I'm curious about LibreOffice now. Who makes that? Is it any good? <laughs> well, it's, it's you know... If, it, if it's in Ubuntu, it, it can't be that bad. <laughs> it's got to be pretty darn good, actually. You've obviously never heard a Vive versus Emacs argument. Basically, <laughs> LibreOffice.org is the website if you want to check it out. And Libre. if you don't want to check it out, you just go to OpenOffice.org and donate that. I'm actually looking forward to playing around with this because I just got Ubuntu running on one of my spare notebooks, which is very exciting. But LibreOffice looks like your usual giant pile of feature-rich open source joy. Uh, the Start Center I'm always a little nervous about. Anything with a Start Center scares me because of stuff I used in the past. And uh, while we're talking open source, Joel J adds, Hi Techzilla, I just recently watched the episode where a viewer asked about making his computer faster for a family in Mozambique. Patrick suggested a clean install for the popular open source Linux OS Ubuntu, but I have something a little bit faster. It is the variant cousin called Zubuntu. It runs the XFCE environment. Sorry if I don't know the correct acronym for that, which is great for computers with low memory. My computer is currently running Zubuntu 10.4 LTS long-term support with an old gateway essential 550 old school with 320 megabytes of RAM. The interface runs smoothly, although you may need to do a little tweaking depending on the situation. It runs most of the same things Ubuntu uses, such as Gparted and codecs and flash installs. I hope this suggestion helps. I'm one of your young fans in high school. Joel, thank you Aww. so much for sending that in. Awesome. And uh, X-U-B-U-N-T-O-U dot org. Super so, cool. That's pretty cool, actually, the whole idea that they're, they're continuing to figure out how to make it more and more accessible to more and more people. And that's up to 11.0.4. Um, Speed, good. Yeah, well, you know, it also reminds me of the happy that is Puppy Linux. Oh. <laughs> Hey, Luke writes in, thought you might be interested in this website. I found it today after watching the episode with Lloyd on and wondering myself what games I could play with my hardware. Well, check out system requirement uh, slab.com slash Cyril, or Siri, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> that URL. Just have, a, just have to pick a game from the menu and click Can You Play It? The online program checks your computer's hardware specs against the required specs of the game and says either a yes or a no. <laughs> and it definitely says like that. your browser and OS are not supported if you try to run it on the OS 10. Uh -huh. <laughs> After trying to figure out a way to send a 30 gigabyte file, yep, that's me trying to run a Windows tool on an OS 10 30 machine. gig. After trying to figure out a way to send 30 gigabyte files over email a while back, we got a few responses like this one from Henrik. One solution could be to use a program like WinRAR to split the file into several smaller files. These can then be sent one by one. Of course, with a 30 gigabyte file, you would end up with lots of files, like thousands, and it would still take the same amount of time and bandwidth to upload. So maybe it wouldn't work great in this case, but for a 100 megabyte file, it's a nice trick. Best regards, Henrik in Sweden. 30 gig uploads. We'll I got a 32 gig a USB key right there. I'm tempted just to overnight it to somebody for whatever that costs. <laughs> there you go. Done. Well, it's funny. Like it's gonna, It probably would take less than 24 hours. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Hey, and Triple 110 chimed in with another idea. In regards to sending large files over the internet, considering using a BitTorrent to send that file. Setting up a private tracker is really easy. You just need to know your public IP address and an available port. Then you would give the torrent file via email uh, for their torrent client and you're off. This way the bandwidth can be managed as well as being available to start and stop it. For more info, see the URL as follows with a bootstrike.com slash article slash create torrent. Signed, triple 110. And we, we've got nice. that link set up in the show notes. It's kind of funny, like one of the things I wanted to make sure we demonstrated, this is like the t1shopper.com 
uh, download calculator. We're going to pretend we're uploading, so it's 30 gigabytes. Just keep thinking of caps, bandwidth caps. Let well, bandwidth caps, and also actually, most 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 home domestics ISPs. Most of your home service is slow, like 768K uh, is three days, 21 hours, and 12 minutes to upload a 30 gigabyte file. If you're lucky to have uh, 1.4 megabits up, you're still talking about uh, one day, 22 hours, and 21 minutes. And this is best case, maximum you know, s speed. Second day envelope. Yeah. It might be quicker. It might be quicker. <laughs> Consider the envelope. Just saying. Split the postage. And I got to say, I haven't thought about spanning files with, win, with WinRAR or WinZip since like the 90s. Oh, it's still, it's still a flood. Remember spanning files across floppy disks? I, I, there's other Brings reasons tear to span, to my too. Eye. Oh, wow. I, remember when, I remember having a floppy drive that held like 77K on each disk. That just seems, that was huge. <laughs> 30 myself. gigabytes. Enough with the nostalgia and the floppy disk, because we are all about the terabyte <laughs> drives here, and the three terabyte drives are even cooler. Bring on the petabyte. Got a question about USB versus two, USB 2.0 versus USB 3.0. Fire it in, because we're going to be talking about that when we come back from our break. We're going to be talking about, well, all sorts of other stuff, like your burning tech questions. We want to hear what you want to know about. Burning tech, a very urgent question, how to upload a somewhat smaller file or share it with your friends or create your very own perfectly legal torrent with stuff you own the copyright to. Techzilla at revision3.com is the email address, or you can post it on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash techzilla. And, of course, we're also on YouTube at YouTube.com slash TechHD. The man is choking, but he's staying here for you. Twitter. I'm trying. <laughs> Twitter is at TechZilla, at Robert Heron. That's him, at Patrick Dorton. And the beloved <laughs> at Veronica. Don't you die on me. No. Thanks so much for watching. I'm, I'm Patrick here. Dorton. I'm Robert Heron. Until next time, you've been watching TechZilla. Now you may ah. Don't die.